Thank you again, Mrs. Williams. We, we truly, truly appreciate it. Thank you. Um, a few updates. We had a wonderful November the 23rd, right before the Thanksgiving holiday. We were able to provide to this community. Again, I've said it a hundred times. We are a component of this community that hopefully can bring everyone together and help support people during the time of need. So this school district, along with many principals across this county, came together to give out almost 1,400 food boxes um, to this community um, to help during that, the Thanksgiving season. So um, that was an outstanding time. But I'll tell you, I enjoyed most the opportunity to, to share in the camaraderie that we experienced as we were giving back to the community. I wish you could have seen the laughs, the, 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 um, the joy, and, and the hard work that the principals were giving as they saw people leave, leave away with smiles. You saw people pull up, and they had a little bit of stress on their face, but just seeing those boxes being placed in those cars, it, it meant a lot to this community. So I want to thank those principals who came out, but also thank the partnership with Save the Children um, for providing that opportunity to, to this community as well. Um, a special shout out to Senator Stevens, who unbeknownst to me came out and actually volunteered and helped um, load cars and load boxes. So that again is a representation of this community coming together. Didn't know he was here, didn't know it was him until after it was over. But I wanna appreciate him for coming out unannounced to, to assist in, in this good effort. But you know, it gets better. So when you start doing well, hopefully things um, continue to, to compound. So we are actually able to announce that we are now in receipt of an additional $20,000 grant through Save the Children. And we are partnering with Groceries on the Go. So we're trying to make sure we cover this entire county. So we did something here at the, at the district office in the central, but on December the 18th, we're going to be in other parts of the county doing the same thing. We're going to be at the Cope Area Career Center at 9 a.m. and at the parking lot of Lake Marion High School, and we'll be giving out food boxes right before the Christmas holiday or the winter break. We're going to continue to do our best, and when we have opportunities to receive grants that we can not only help our children but help this community, then we're committed to doing that. So you'll hear more about it December 19th at 9 a.m. Cope Eric Career Center and Lake Marion High School will be our two sites that will be providing free food boxes to our, our families on December the, the 18th. I'm sorry, yes, December the 18th. So that, that's, that's the great news. Um, but also, um, Madam Chair, members of the board, as I've always done, I try to give you guys an update on the uh, the coronavirus and, and where we are as a, as a community and as a state. Um, the disease activity report came out for December the 2nd, um, and it indicates that Orangeburg is in, in the high category across all three metrics. Um, right now, our positivity rate is 18.1%. So we've risen significantly. We got it down to around 10%. Um, but now we have um, spiked back up to 18% positive, and a copy of that disease report is is in your in your folder. But also want to take an opportunity to share some some numbers specific to our students and our and our staff population. The um, employees that have been impacted by COVID, whether testing positive or having to quarantine due to being a close contact or a at home contact, we've had um, since the uh, July 17th for employees 255 employees that have been impacted, of those 57 um, have been positive cases. The others had to, um, to quarantine and um, due to being in close contact. But also, um, just a number that, that, that kind of concerns me as well is, since the return from the Thanksgiving break, we've had 13 positives. So 57 total dating all the way back to July. But just in the last week, of those 57, 13 um, were within the last week. So as we transition to our student numbers, um, the student numbers as of 12-7, we've had 330 students impacted by the coronavirus. 75 of those are positive, um, and that's been since September the 1st. So, 330 cases since September the 1st. 75 of those have been actual positive cases. 41 of those 75 
was since we returned from Thanksgiving. 41 of those 75 total cases have been in the last week. Um, all other cases have been a close contact or have had to leave school due to having symptoms. Um, as of 6.06, .06, as I was sitting here, Nurse Padgett sent me another email of another positive. So that positive has gone up to 42. So it is an ongoing thing that we're trying to do our best to manage and make sure that we're taking actions to ensure safety for, for everybody, our students, our, our families, our parents, and our employees. Um, with that being said, I'm gonna ask Nurse Padgett to step forward with some information in regards to the, the hot topic of the BioNext bio, bio next Now rapid testing that you've heard about in schools. And she's gonna give you an update. Had an opportunity to bring in uh, a group of nurses and ask their consideration and their feelings on this testing. As I've read through the 116 page document that was provided um, that outlines the guidelines and expectations to, to do this. And um, I'll turn it over to Nurse Padgett. And we've also surveyed our nurses to get their feedback from every single nurse. Because I think it's important that we explain to this community that some things are a lot more difficult than they may seem on the surface to actually do. So I wanted to share with you the sentiments of our nurses, but also let the expert here, Mrs. Padgett, speak, because she's living in this um, space every single day. So, Nurse Padgett. All right, good evening, Madam Chair, board members, um, Dr. Foster and senior staff. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak with you tonight. Um, Dr. Foster is right. We did survey all of our nurses. We had 100% participation in the survey. So all 29 full-time nurses did complete the survey. And um, you'll see the information shared here tonight. <clears throat> School districts in South Carolina have been given the opportunity to administer a rapid test, so this is an antigen test, um, to students and staff who present at school with symptoms. And um, when we surveyed our nurses, 26 of the 29 were, in, were against um, giving the test at school. <clears throat> the testing location requires a room that has to be um, set up just for testing. The uh, administration of a COVID test is done within this particular room outside of the isolation room and outside of a nurse's office. The room has to sit vacant for 24 hours after a positive test and an hour after a negative test. And we asked our, our school nurses if our schools had space for that and 79% of our nurses are reporting no, our schools do not have enough room um, to provide this type of um, setup for testing. <clears throat> How would you rate your comfort level with administering the test um, based on the training that you have received and the training comes from the company that provides the test? We had no nurses extremely comfortable. We had six nurses who said they were comfortable. Uh, nine, per, nine were not comfortable and 14 were extremely uncomfortable. Does your school have someone who can be trained and available to assist you in administering the test to a student who is unwilling to be tested? So working with children, especially our younger children, we will have some students who will be unwilling to test. Uh, four of our nurses report, yes, they have un, unlicensed assistive personnel who could assist and 25 nurses are reporting no, that at currently with the staff at their school, they don't have anyone to assist with testing. Do you have any concerns with liability related to administering the COVID-19 rapid test? Uh, 24 of our nurses say they do have significant concern. The concerns that were reported were the efficiency of the test um, with the rapid test on false negatives the efficiency can be up to about 50%. So it will give a false sense of security. Uh, the way the system is set up, if someone tests negative to a rapid test, then they're referred for a PCR test, which is the test that is a deep nasal swab. If anyone's had a test, the deep nasal swab test, it takes a few days to get your results back. Um, a negative with symptoms would have to be con um, confirmed with one of, with one of these tests. Also, um, increased risk for exposure. So 
there is some concern that stu ill students will be sent to school just for testing. And we're asking all ill students showing any symptoms of COVID to please stay at home. There's also potential for a student injury in the event that we have an uncooperative student and there's no assistance and possibly even when there is assistance, there is that potential, <clears throat> excuse me, for student injury. Uh, misdiagnosis and delayed care. So um, as you know, COVID symptoms um, mimic a lot of other illnesses, flu, sinus infections, um, even asthma. And so this having testing in schools could potentially delay care for other illnesses. And then staffing limitations. So currently we have four substitute school nurses. Um, most of our substitute school nurses like to substitute just in a particular zone or area. Uh, currently we have two nurses out either under isolation or quarantine and therefore it could be um, an issue with our staffing. And then duplication of services. Um, there are many community testing sites available now. DHEC has added some um, designated dates and sites in our area. Um, and so those are the concerns that the nurses have shared with us. Do you have any questions regarding our nurses' concerns with the test? Okay, Dr. Foster. On Dr. O'Quinn. Uh -huh. Yes, ma'am. What do you have in place as a student if he is to take the test? Well, we would have to refer that student out with their with their parent to their physician um, physician's office to collect the test. Uh, the test would have to be administered with parental consent and it would be one consent per test. Um, and so currently DHEC includes COVID-19 and symptoms suggestive of COVID-19 on their exclusion list and we are required to exclude staff or students who present with symptoms suggested of COVID-19. Yes, ma'am. Yes, Ms. Betty. Yeah. Um, do we have full-time nurses at all of our schools? At all of our school sites. Okay. So school Lockett sites. Elementary and Branchville High School share a site and they okay. share a full-time nurse. Okay. Same at HKT, Bethune, okay. Bowman. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, um, when you talked about your four yes for, un, for unlicensed assistance, who does that include? So. Um, there are some unlicensed assistive personnel who have been identified and trained to assist when a nurse is out for things like first aid or assisting students with medications. Um, it depends on the particular staff at each individual school. It could be a principal, it could be a guidance counselor. Mm -hmm. um, some of our schools actually employ certified nursing assistants as aides or shadows one-on-one -on -one for students. So um, it, it could be any of those folks. Okay. The reason I asked because as I was reading um, about the testing, it also talked about using trained athletic mm -hmm. trainers. trainers. Right. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Other Ma questions? Madam Chair, if I could add something um, <laughs> as well, <clears throat> that the another aspect of, of administering these tests is these. This is biohazardous once you have a actual positive test. So you have to also have a means of discarding of biohazardous waste. Um, so that's also something we have to partner with someone to actually take that away. And that's also in the guidelines as well. But um, it also requires a, a circumstance where I believe if, if four kids come down with, with symptoms, they have to test them in four different locations. So that's four separate classrooms, and each one of those classrooms must be vacant for at least an hour after a test, 24 hours if there is a positive. So that in itself is a possibility for the space limitations to, to, get, this, to get this done. But there's also a license fee for each site that administers the test as well that we're responsible for, for taking care of. And that's in that, that document that you guys have in front of you. So it's a little more complicated than I believe um, 
you know, I, I even understood until I actually had an opportunity to read through some of those. Um, I don't know, Dr. Foster, you or the nurse can answer. Is this something that South Carolina wants to do and we have, we can decide not to? Is this something that they're just looking at and we can decide? Because listen at the nurses, our nurses don't feel comfortable doing it. So do we have a choice? Yes, it is a district choice. Right now, the um, what I'm hearing is about 50% of the school districts have opted not to okay. and 50 have. So that that's kind of, and that's not an exact percentage, but that's pretty much what, what, what I'm hearing across the state that we had to send out a survey um, that we had to complete. Um, as superintendent, I hadn't had an opportunity to speak to this board and the nurses, so we marked undecided. So right now, our status is undecided until we make a final decision um, to do or not to do. Okay, thank you. Um, I see we have listed here as an action item. So therefore, we're looking to take action tonight, right? Yes, ma'am. Before we, um, when we did the agenda, um, we were still in a hybrid situation. So right now, the board can elect to take, take action or not. The fact that we've gone completely virtual and we have until January, it is not an, an, an actual time-sensitive item. But if the board says, you know what, this is what we want to go ahead and take an action on and get it behind us, then that, that's also the board's pleasure. But it, it is not a, a circumstance where it's going to be an immediate need since we're now moved to all virtual. Madam Chair, um, listening to the presentation from Nurse Padgett, I see more cons, more negatives than positive for this district in taking on this particular um, mandate. I'm calling it a mandate. So my suggestion would be for the board to, okay, she has it, not take action. I mean, take action, but not approve. <laughs> Okay. Other questions or comments? Thank you, nurse. All right, thank you. Okay. Is there anything else, Dr. Foster? No, ma'am. Okay. Now we're down to an action item on the testing. Madam Chair, mm -hmm. I move to accept the superintendent's recommendation <clears throat> to not offer. COVID-19 testing for students. Second. It has been moved in property second that we take the superintendent's recommendation at this time that we not take action on the testing for our students. Are there any questions or comments? Not all in favor, let it be known by show sign. Thank you. Any opposes? <laughs> Did we ever find out whether Dr. Uh, okay. He's on? Okay, thank you. Okay, so we will not take action on um, the testing tonight. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was we took action, I'm sorry, but it was voted that we will not. Okay. Next on our agenda, we have the curriculum and instruction update. Good evening to New Orangeburg community, board chair, and Dr. Foster. I'm Quinn Dantzler, director of virtual school education, and it is my pleasure to share updates about Orangeburg Online. Our presentation will be provided in a few moments. At this time, we have some brief technical difficulties, so I will articulate the information for those who may be listening and participating virtually, and our board members have a copy in their possession. 
So Orangeburg Online is Orangeburg County School District's virtual school professional, virtual school uh, program for students who decide to continue learning at home. Beginning on December the 5th, open enrollment began for students who would like to continue learning at home for the remainder of the school year. At this time, we have approximately 863 students who have made that decision. All students who are new to Orangeburg Online must complete an application by submitting the form on the district website. Once enrolled, students are committed to the program until June 4, 2021. We ask that all families who realize at this point in time that Orangeburg Online is the best choice for them, that they complete the application by December the 18th, 2020. The application window will remain open and students can continue to enroll at any point in time they believe it is best for their family. To support our virtual learning, we have provided a set of updates for both our students and parents. For students, we are providing a consistent layout in Seesaw and Canvas, which are our learning management systems. They provide students with clear academic expectations for each day. For our parents, we have provided access to the Seesaw and Canvas app. This allows parents with students in the same household to clearly understand what is expected of their students each day. For students who are pre-K to second grade, they are using an iPad and the app known as Seesaw. On that device, students simply click the calendar view and select the exact date and complete the activities outlined for that day. And students in grades 3K to 12, we use the Canvas LMS learning management system. Students have an opportunity to see the virtual teachings and recordings made by their teachers. And they also have a list of academic exercises outlined for the day. We believe that providing students with clear expectations, each child knows exactly what is expected of them each day. We have asked our teachers to indicate what students are learning and how they will be assessed. We want our teachers to provide them with lessons that demonstrate why students are learning the content and that they have activities that will help them master the indicator. To support our teachers and schools, we have implemented several support measures. We have trained all principals on using Canvas and Seesaw, both from the teacher perspective and the student perspective. We have trained all teachers in each one of our buildings to use Canvas and Seesaw. We've modeled the process as well as provided training tutorials and videos for them to access at any point in time. For our students and parents, we provided a pop-up announcement in Canvas so when they sign in, they see the written directions as well as an image with the steps outlined on what students should do and complete each day. And lastly, lastly, we asked all of our schools to make an individual robocall to their parents in a creative way. So we are truly excited about the updates and the changes we've made to virtual learning, and we truly believe that they will support student advancement. Do you have any questions for me at this time? With this training for the principals and for the teachers, were all of it virtual, or was some of it face-to-face? -face? Did some of the teachers provide or help other teachers who were having problems or some concerns? For our principals, all of our training was face-to-face, -face, and they participated in a hands-on 90-minute training. And for all of our teachers, they had the option to participate in a face-to-face -face or a virtual learning situation, depending on their school leadership. And I will say that only two schools to date 
chose the virtual learning option as most of them were trained prior to the Thanksgiving break. And of course, we encourage teachers to work with one another in a collegiate fashion to support them. Okay, I just wanted to know if they had the opportunity to decide which one they wanted to participate in. So yes, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Other questions? Yes, Ms. Alma. I think it's Orangeburg online. online. Um, assignments are posted and then they are closed. Who de does the teacher determine when the assignment is closed? or is uniform across the district? Each teacher decides when assignments are posted for their students. So they have full autonomy with that. Now we ask that teachers post and turn on their lessons at the onset of classes. Okay. So at the beginning of the class period, they can click a button and the assignments are visible to the students at that moment. Okay, but if it's an assignment that's due later, um, who determines then when the assignment is locked or closed? The teacher decides that okay. when the assignment is closed and no longer available to the student. Madam Chair, do the parents know this and the, and the students know this? Yes, ma'am. In Canvas and in Seesaw, they can see when an assignment is made available and the due date for that assignment as well as the time. And parents can see this in the Canvas Parent app if they sign in and view their students' work. So they can view, they simply can't complete any information. Now, another question. Okay, a parent is working and assignment is assigned during the day. And let's say it closes at 5 p.m. or 7 p.m., anywhere between that time. So the parent may not have gotten home yet to, you know, if the child has a question about the assignment, so therefore the assignment is locked and the child doesn't get to do the assignment or get any assistance with the assignment. So, so hopefully we do not have instances where an assignment is given during the school day and then locked within the school day. Typically that is not the case <clears throat> and um, should that be the case, if you know of it, we will work and support both that principal and that school. Yeah. But students have up to five days to complete their assignments to be counted as present in accordance to our district attendance policy. Okay, that needs to be communicated then. Yes, ma'am, that yeah. information has been shared yeah, it with needs principals. needs to be communicated again because some I of them understand. are doing the day um, and it, the assignment's open for maybe an hour or two and then it's locked. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Norman, we, we'll, we'll make sure we have a principal's meeting tomorrow, so okay. we'll reemphasize that for our principals. And ho hopefully tonight, this is a unique circumstance. We have to be flexible, and we can't be rigid in those circumstances because things happen. Internet goes down as mm -hmm. it go, has done gone in the West twice, right. then we have to make those modifications. So, yes, ma'am, we'll make sure that that information is communicated clearly and, and understood that um, if there's an issue, we ask that those parents please reach out to the building level principal first right. yes. and allow them to address that issue um, situation by situation. Okay, because there's a great concern right now with parents as well as students. Um, we have a lot of kids who are failing. Mm -hmm. And the grades are, I don't know how many assignments are required per week, graded assignments per week or per quarter. But we have grades like threes and fours and anything below 50, I thought 50 would have been our lowest grade, but we have grades like 14, 15, it's a concern. That is a current concern. Thank you for bringing that to our attention and we will work with our principals and teachers to address that. Yes, that was Madam Chair, I have the same concern as um, Ms. Ulmer. Um, this is how I see it. You know, anything can happen during the course of the day. Of a day, today we tried to download videos, even though they said they were downloaded. We could never find the videos wherever they went to. We just, I'm talking about me and my grandson. You know, <laughs> grandma struggling too. <laughs> Back in school, uh, we never saw them. So he was supposed to review those videos. Um, I guess for a test that may be kind of later. So if that didn't happen, and then he has to take this assessment that things are not probably not going to go too well. Um, and I'm, I'm looking at that Friday that's being used for group or whatever. 
maybe that would be a day when they could open up, you know, any activities that the kids may not have completed. Mm-hmm. That could be makeup work day or something like that. You know, that, that, you know I'm just thinking about how can we, we can better serve our, our customers. Because right now, I'm one of the customers too and I'm getting kind of frustrated. <laughs> Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Oh. And you said yeah. all of our teachers were trained. Yes, ma'am. Who, who did the training? The trainings were conducted by myself and the other instructional technology facilitators. And we asked that a principal sit in on each one of the trainings so that their teachers were aware of the content that we were sharing and the administrators were aware. We also provided the teachers with what's known as a teacher clarity focus walk. So as they craft their lessons, they are including the information that we expect. Now I must say that we enacted this change on yesterday day um, fully because we realized that some of our parents were frustrated with the differences across the district. So please, we do ask that you give us a little bit of time um, to see this change take place because we started on yesterday at the beginning, the training process at the beginning of November. Thank you. Other question below Madam here? Chair, just one other thing. Um, truancy. I don't know who deals with truancy, but uh, are we checking on our kids to find out whether they are in class or whether they are deliberately cutting class or they're being put out of class? Those things should be handled at this building level and then okay. reported back up here to us coming through Dr. McMichael and, and Mr. John's office. Okay. Other comments or questions? Okay. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening to Madam Chair, Ms. Tyler, board members, Superintendent Dr. Foster, and the community. I am Wanda McMichael, Director of Testing and Accountability, and tonight I'm going to share with you some information regarding our waivers and our upcoming professional learning opportunities. Currently, the State Department is seeking a waiver from all federally required assessments. However, until that time that we receive the waiver, we have to operate as though our children are going to be tested, okay? That testing is scheduled to be the last 20 days of the school year. Now, the EAA requires that all of these tests are administered online. However, there is a proviso that um, we can submit a waiver so that our students don't have to take certain assessments online. They can take them paper pencil. There's also a waiver where we don't have to adhere to that 20 day guideline at the end of the school year. We can ask them to extend our testing window. So we wanted to know how did our teachers and our principals feel about this? So we surveyed them. If you look at that slide, you'll see the greatest numbers are in our elementary school grades for ELA and for math. Then we asked them the question, do you think we should extend the school day, excuse me, the testing on window, and if so, by how many days? Um, Over 80% of our teachers and administrators felt that we should ask for a waiver to increase our testing window. Over 70% of our administrators and teachers felt that we should increase the window by 10 days. So, after looking at the data, we made some decisions. We decided to submit a waiver for SC Ready, ELA, and Math for our elementary school grades. We further submitted a waiver, an additional waiver, to increase our testing window by 10 days, giving us a 30-day test window, SC ready, and SC pass. Any questions about the testing waiver? Questions? How many board members? Ms. Almer? Okay, I see the testing that you, you plan to ask for waiver here. Does that, what about EOC? 
EOC, that one, that this one does not include the EOC okay. way. No, ma'am. Okay, thank you. We still have to give the EOC. Our window is going to be January 14th through February 10th. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. No questions? Other questions? All right, moving on. Professional development. Well, if you were excited about our virtual um, professional learning extravaganza one, you're going to be really excited about extravaganza two. <laughs> this year, or this time, we have over 60 unique sessions that we're going to offer to all of our staff members. To date, over 1,200 people or employees have registered for sessions. It's going to take place on Monday, January 4th, and just like the district, this PD is 100% virtual. Um, for the district, our sessions are going to be offered 9 o'clock to 12 o'clock p.m., and then the schools will offer sessions from 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock p.m. Just like the district sessions are 100% virtual, so will the school sessions be 100% virtual. Now, teachers and staff will participate in those sessions on site, so they will be in the buildings participating in PD. We published the document that you have in your handout. Everyone should have a copy of the catalog. We published that on November 19th. We gave teachers and staff members an opportunity to look at the sessions and the descriptions before opening our registration on November 30th. We then closed our registration on December 4th, and by December 16th, all of our teachers and employees will receive the links to their Microsoft Teams sessions. Are there any questions about professional development? The questions. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, next we have student services update. Michael, yes. do we have opportunities for all employees? Yes, we do. We do. If you look in the book, we have a section for each of the different categories. And then at the very back of the book, you have all of the session descriptions. Okay? Also, let me note, there was, I think, two sessions that originally were going to be face-to-face, -face, but because of everything going on, we switched it, so now everything is 100% virtual. Thank you. Board members will also get a link. Okay, Dr. Calloway. All right. Good evening, Madam Chair and Board of Trustees. The mm -hmm. Student Service Department would like to share with you initiatives in our department that will support our students and parents. This evening, we have Ms. Faith Arthur, our coordinator of counseling and career services. She will present a initiative to you. Good evening. Good evening. As mentioned already, I'd like to thank Madam Chair, board members, as well as Dr. Foster and other executive team members for giving me this opportunity. I am Faith Arthur, I'm the Counseling Career Services Coordinator for Orangeburg County School District. And then we'd like to share just a few initiatives that we have available for this upcoming uh, semester and the school year. Okay, the first one that we will be sharing is Our Father's Closet. This is an outreach ministry, and you should have this in your packet, um, that will be providing coats for our students. The counselors at each school will work to collaborate with their school staff to identify students who are in need of a coat. And we're asking that schools provide at least uh, names for students, up to 10 students who will be receiving a coat for this particular initiative. Okay. Uh, this is being sponsored by our parenting coordinator, Ms. Kimberly Ray, and monetary donations are being accepted by the churches that are receiving this particular activity. The churches will provide the um, coats to our school district, and we'll actually do this initiative on December the 14th and 15th, which is next Monday and Tuesday. And her contact information is listed there for the Our Father's Closet. As far as the Department of Student Services is concerned, we do have college and career planning awareness activities that we're working on, and you should have this in your packet as well. 
One of the things that we are very excited about this upcoming Friday, December 11th at 10, 10 a.m., we will be providing our first virtual workshop, which will be held uh, during C Day, which is on Friday, for our students. Now, this workshop is actually targeting our juniors and seniors and their parents, but we're actually opening it up to all of our students, parents, and community members. And we've scheduled this uh, to have collaborative efforts between our colleges on um, career planning, primarily completing the FAFSA for this particular event. During this time, we will share some information about what is FAFSA, why it is important, and the window has opened for us to begin completing those applications for our high school students. It opened October the 1st, and it will end on June the 30th. As we looked at our data from across the state, we realized that we have lots of students, lots of families because of COVID-19 that have not completed the FAFSA. Uh, some are still completing those actual uh, tax documents for this particular school term. So we wanted to use this as an initiative to reach out to our parents and provide some support as well as some help for our students during this particular time. One of the things that we realized, um, according to the National College Attainment Network, is that 90% of the students that do complete their FAFSA, the seniors, those students who complete them go directly to college, compared to 55% of the students who do not complete those FAFSA applications. So in order to continue our college-going population here in Orange Spring County, we want to make sure that we give students as much opportunity and resources as possible, as well as our parents to make sure that they are successful for this particular upcoming event. Now, what will our students receive as a part of this particular initiative? Students will get an opportunity to understand how to create their FAFSA ID, which is very important. That's necessary in order for them to complete that particular document. They'll also be able to identify the documents that are needed to complete it, the college admissions rep will go through that with them as well. They'll also get a chance to understand the SARS or student aid report, uh, what is entailed in that uh, in terms of the types of aids that are available. And they'll also understand the different types of financial aid that are available for our students and for them as they are looking at post-secondary plans after they graduate from high school. Additionally, uh, we're looking at some additional opportunities that, we're have, that are in, in progress are in the process of being planned. We're working with the Pace Scholarship Academy, and we're looking to provide an information session in January for our students and parents to receive some additional information as it relates to scholarship opportunities, uh, not only locally but nationally. We have a very robust uh, group of students that are completing applications. As of today, we actually received three um, students who have uh, received finalists for the Coca-Cola Scholarship, which is a very prestigious a scholarship here in our county. And so we want to make sure that we're providing as many opportunities as possible for the different types of uh, scholarships that are available. In addition to that, we will have some additional college and career readiness opportunities for students in all grade levels. Uh, we're in the process of, process, excuse me, of planning a virtual career fair for our students in grade, grades pre-K through 12th grade to make sure that we have offerings for all of our students in Orangeburg County. So at this time, this completes our presentation for student services as it relates to college and career opportunities. Do we have any questions at this time or any comments? Questions or comments? Ms. Edwards? Uh, Ms. Arthur, uh, what are some of the ways that you're communicating it to the parents? I know it's going to be on the website, but d definitely for the parents to know. You know, I know sometimes the children, they know about it and won't say anything, but we definitely need the parents to know. So what are the ways you all are getting the information out to the parents so they would be aware of this on this Friday? Thank you so much, Ms. Edwards. One of the things our career specialists, and I want to highlight three in particular who actually uh, chaired this particular event. Um, the first one is Ms. Tiffany Picard from Clark Middle School, School, excuse me, Ms. Tierra Omer from North Middle High School, and Ms. Janetta Williams. So we have a group of career specialists that are working in collaboration with all the career counselors and school counselors in our county. We're actually calling parents. We're doing robocalls that are going out. Um, it's actually being placed on the Facebook pages of the different schools. We're also using uh, Canvas and Seesaw, not Seesaw, Canvas and um, Microsoft Teams, excuse me, to make sure that as students are logging into their classes, they're actually seeing those particular opportunities as well. So we'll have that in collaboration with working with our public relations department to make sure that they help us as well to make sure we get it out to parents. Ms. Edwards, can I add something as well? And, and this is an opportunity, that, that's a great point. So I'm going to publicly ask parents. We use Facebook for a lot of things, guys. Here's an opportunity, please, if you have a Facebook page, please communicate this to, to individuals so that it's far-reaching and people are aware. So let's use that social media platform to make sure students are getting this information. Um, 
so that they don't miss this opportunity. So parents don't miss this opportunity. So I encourage everyone, if you have a Facebook, please send a message to all of your followers, letting them know that, that this is available and we'll have information on our, on our Facebook page on how to access that, but also on our district website too. So this is an opportunity for this community to use all of our resources to get information out. This, the data for FAFSA forms are down across the nation. Um, and they had the forethought to think about putting this together. So please help us get this information in the hands of the individuals that will benefit. So when June comes, um, they're not behind the eight ball. Thank you, Dr. Foster. Madam Chair, my question is, suppose there was someone, as the data said, who did not do the FAFSA and they graduated and they're just home. Can they, can they participate in this too? Yes, sir. I heard it. Okay. Yes, sir. Awesome. And our representatives are from our local university, so we do have um, our partner institutions here in Orangeburg County working with us. And so that's why we wanted to make sure that we provided opportunities so we'll, they would be segues for them if they wanted to start going and picking up those post-secondary plans, they still have an opportunity to do so. You know, I'm just very grateful to hear this uh, coming that we are providing these services for our students. I know that this process can be very intimidating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so um, I'm, I'm grateful that we are waiting to the end to get started with it and that students will have ample time and parents will have ample time. And I appreciate that very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Brunson. And I, I do want to share that our high schools have already begun. They've, they've done the work in small group sessions. Mm -hmm. So high schools have already done some uh, FAFSA nights. They've also done some senior nights meeting with parents. But this is a scope that we're working with from the district level as well, just to give additional wraparound services. Good. And my question, Ms. Arthur, uh, if on the Facebook, who will we say if they have a question, contact you? Yes, okay. they can. And, and what, what, what would be the number? Just um, 5454? Yes, ma'am. Gotcha. Okay. Yes, ma'am. And Thank we can you. get those questions answered as well. And we will have a Q&A during that session where well, they'll be able to ask the representatives questions during that time and follow up after the, the session is over. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Any other questions or comments? Do we have career specialists in all of our high schools? We have um, school counselors in some cases that are serving in both capacities. So we do have uh, career services being offered in all of our high schools. So we do have cases where we have um, them providing dual roles, but those are individuals that are certified to do so and provide those services for our students. Yes, ma'am. Elsa? Um, I know you've done a lot of things with the juniors and seniors as well as, you know, trying to get this financial aid and getting the word out. Do you have any idea or can you give us some percentages or numbers on how many juniors and seniors throughout the um, county that have, you know, participated in these things that you've done. Do you have an idea? Okay. As far as the activities that we already have in place or actually the FAFSA completed, the completed status in our All county. of that. Mm -hmm. um, well, I tell you what, we can get those numbers. We do. Uh, one okay. of the things that we do on a monthly basis, our counselors complete mm -hmm. what's called a monthly accountability form. So they okay. track every month the okay. data, all the encounters that they have, as well as our career specialists. They're two mm -hmm. separate forms. So career specialists, they work on a form that specifically, specifically excuse me, speaks to the EEDA legislation. Our professional school counselors, they have a separate form that checks all the different encounters. So we will have that data. We're working on a report as we speak for Dr. Fawcett that we'll be able to share with you when we come back in January. Okay. One more question. Yes, ma'am. Um, so once you get that data and you get those names, who's chasing those kids who may not be participating? That our counselors and career okay. specialists. And one of the, another thing that we've done this year, we have parent contact logs. So every month, they're actually documenting their contacts and communication. So at any time, if there's a, a call that says, have you made contact with this parent, a counselor or career specialist should be able to show you, yes, I've reached out to this parent if there's a concern. So we're trying to make sure that was one of the things Dr. Foster mentioned, that he wanted to make sure all of our students have been touched by right. the end of the school year. They know who their counselors are. They know who their career specialists are. Um, understand that this is a unique environment for us. We're working. Uh, remotely in the field of counseling, you're used to touching your students. That's, that's mm. the field where you're used to actually being face-to-face -face and being able to work with the student, as well as, as with all the other professions. But we want to make sure that we are at least calling, reaching out, and we use C-Day as an opportunity to do so. Okay, thank you. So, yes, Mrs. Pelzer, I, I met with Mrs. Arthur, and, and I was pleased to know that when I, when I said I wanted every single child touched and be able to identify that they were already processes that she was putting in place to make sure that that was occurring. 
So now this is just the actual execution of, of that. So we're in the midst of that. And, and we need to be able to say and not wait for data to tell us where our children are. We can have and touch every single child. As, as a former guidance counselor myself, I, I understand wholeheartedly how important that is that we can put a name to a number and, and a circumstance to that child. So they, they've been working wholeheartedly in doing that. And, and it's a heavy lift, especially doing it during the challenges of COVID. But um, they're going to give them a report first quarter and the first semester, and then we'll, we'll follow it on throughout. So they're working tirelessly to do that. Uh, the only thing I, I want to say this, as a retired guidance counselor who worked under Ms. Arthur, there would not be a school that you would not, you'd be able to get the information from the principal and the guidance counselor because we have to do those reports every month and turn it in to the principal. And that is something that it has saved, it will save you because it tells everything you're doing. And we have to do those reports to Ms. Arthur every month. So that is one of the great things, it's a great piece of data. Other comments or questions? Very good report. If not, thank you very kindly. Thank yes. you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> operations. Okay, next we have operations. Mr. Grant. Good evening, Madam Chair, board members. Um, I wanted to bring you three updates this evening. Um, in the presentation, you can see that we're going to talk about the district's architectural and engineering firms, painting of activity buses, and then energy performance contracting. And I'll stop at the end of each section to allow you to ask any questions based on that section. Um, the first update is that um, the RFP process was completed and our intent to award letter was sent out on November 24th. Um, for our architectural and engineering firms. Um, this was a two-stage review of the RFP process during stage one. There was independent scoring of the bid packets by, by district-level senior staff. And then during stage two, we did interviews with the highest scoring firms. And um, we had the senior staff, as long as two of our board members were able to participate in that. And based on the scores from those, um, those interviews, we have four architectural firms that we have selected to uh, represent the district. And that is LS3P, Brownstone Design, Boomerang Design, and McMillan, Pasden, and Smith. And then we have one engineering firm that was selected, which is Buford Goff Engineering. And the great thing about them is they work with all four of the um, architectural firms that, that have been selected as well, so they'll be able to, to collaborate with them. The benefits... All right, I'm going to leave this one. I think they're moving it, and I'm moving it at the same time. All right, so the benefits to, uh, to Orangeburg County are that um, we have multiple firms, so we can receive more competitive prices and move, and move a little more quickly on um, projects. We don't have to go through the full RFP process each time we may have a renovation or a build or anything that we would need architectural services for. Um, we also know that if a firm is not performing well, we can move on to one of the other other firms um, quickly and they can take over and, and take over our project and, and move forward. And then again, um, our engineering firm will be able to work with all of the, uh, the architectural um, firms that we have selected. And the types of projects that we'll be able to do with these groups, um, of course, any kind of renovations of our facilities, any new design and build and then um, a facility study and any recommendations that would go along with that. And what, what one thing that's going to be great is mechanical system replacements that can be done by our engineering firm without having to, to incur other costs by having other groups involved. So are there any questions in regards to the architectural and engineering firms? Questions for Mr. Grant? Madam Chair, if I can add one thing, just so the community is aware, the benefit of doing this, and, and unlike most things, schools are governed under the Office of School Facilities. So there's some things that you have to have an architect to do and give approval in order to, to have any renovations to a school. Something that may seem simple, we have to have that or the certificate of occupancy could be removed from that school. So you have to have these to verify when you're doing work on a school, school's campus. So it's above and beyond um, what would normally happen under regular construction. So I just wanted the community to be aware this is why we need an architect. So often when things 
that seems simple need to be fixed and it takes so long is because you have to go through the process to get an architect to approve it, to get it approved to OSF before any corrections can be done. This will help speed up that process as we address needs and work orders that are put in by schools. Next on the list, I want to talk about our activity buses within our district. Um, as you all may be aware that our buses look very different depending on where they're, where they're located in the county. So um, we have put out an RFP and um, that was closed and we are going to be sending an intent to award letter tomorrow. And um, all of our activity buses will be painted um, to a standardized design that our communications team was able to create. And you can see what, the, uh, what that design looks like in all of our buses will have that, they'll, they'll be painted white and then they'll have that design on there. Um, and our, our communications team will continue to work with the, uh, the winning bidder to make sure that they scale this to, to fit the different size and types of buses that we have. And um, as soon as we get all of that finalized, we'll start sending our buses to begin um, getting them painted to that, to that unified color with that design. Are there any questions in regards to this? Okay, I will move on to the last um, area, which is the uh, energy performance contracting. And I just wanted to share with you that this is information item only right now. Um, we will be bringing back uh, more information regarding this um, after an RFP has gone out and, and we've gone through this, through this process, but we wanted to give you all some background as to what energy performance contracting is. Um, so you see basic, a basic definition there. Um, our energy performance contract is a tool to reduce our energy and water expenditures by upgrading our inefficient and poor, poor performing equipment. And our savings are guaranteed for the life of the contract, which can run anywhere from, from 15 to 20 years. In short, we'll do things like put in new HVAC systems, new um, toilet and sink fixtures and things like that. Um, throughout our schools and new lighting, which by putting more energy efficient items in there will reduce the cost that we're spending. So let me talk about our costs that we are, are, are going through every year with um, energy. So annually, our district spends around $3.9 million in energy costs. This is power, mm -hmm. gas, water. The potential energy costs after we go through and do equipment upgrades at our facilities, and again, this is we've had a preliminary audit done with one firm, but we would have to do a full-scale energy grade audit that would allow us to have these exact numbers, but the, the numbers I'm giving you should be fairly close. But our potential energy costs after upgrading HVACs, lighting, um, and our, our water conservation and doing those things could be $2.8 million annually, which you see is a savings of $1.1 million. That $1.1 million savings, if you go through an energy performance contract, is guaranteed. Meaning if you don't save that much on your bill, they will turn around and, and write you a check for the difference. Because you're going to use that $1.1 million to pay for the things that you're going to be putting into your building, the new HVAC, the new sinks, um, toilets, and, those, and the new lighting systems and all of that. So the benefits of this performance contract, besides saving money that we can then turn around and put into upgrading our facilities, um, of course, new systems require less maintenance. And so you're not spending general fund money to fix broken HVAC systems or to go in and replace lights and, and do those different things. Um, our maintenance department can then focus on preventative um, maintenance. Uh, within our systems, going through and cleaning coils on HVAC systems instead of having to fix broken ones, um, going through and, and, and making sure things are working at high performance. Um, we know that lighting improves the, improves the appearance of, of a room or of a building. Um, potentially, there are some studies out there that show that, that lighting um, improvements also improve student performance. Um, we could also increase our savings by installing solar panels. We do have some facilities that, that we have room that we can install solar panels where there, there is the potential that that building would be completely energy, um, energy neutral, meaning there is zero cost because what you're making off of the solar panels pays for all of their energy costs. And then all of these savings that we can have, um, they're savings to our general fund and um, we wouldn't be spending them in operations and instead could turn that money into the most important area, which is our instructional services department. 
Um, and just as a review, the systems that we would be looking to upgrade, which would be our HVAC, which is not just the systems, not just the HVAC units, but also the control units that allow us to set those um, so that they're running at optimal performance, that we're not cooling a facility from, you know, 8 p.m., to 6 a.m. When, when nobody's occupying the building, but making sure that all of those controls are in place. We know that LED lighting is a lot cheaper and more efficient, so it would be going through and, and installing LED lighting throughout all of our facilities. Um, water conservation is the term used for things like our toilets, sinks, and in our cafeterias, making sure that we're not wasting water and, and using more than we need to. Um, we have our building envelope systems, which is our roof and windows and the insulation that we would make sure um, those were upgraded so that we're not losing energy because we have um, poor sealants around our windows or our a lack of insulation. And then we have a lot of old transformers in our buildings um, with our power and those things give off a whole lot of heat and because of that they, they eat up energy. And, and there it's, just, it's a hidden cost but it's a necessary cost because you need the transformers. So we put in more energy efficient transformers, less heat, less energy, and everything runs a little bit better. And then again, the solar panels offer us an opportunity to not only um, uh, to, to, to negate our, our energy um, costs at a location, but allow us um, potentially even to make energy, um, make a little bit of funds if our, if our energy costs are, um, are go well. So, um, what questions do you have about um, energy performance contracting? Again, let me review that this is not something that we just go out and do. This is something that we'll put an RFP out for. There are multiple um, vendors around the, the nation that would, would love to come into our district and do this for us. Um, and so we'll put the RFP out and then, of course, we would select a vendor based on that process before we were to, to move forward. Carlson? Facilities and the pipe to get cold. What do we have in place to keep the pipes warm from bursting? So that would be working as part of the insulation. Um, the things that we would need to do as part of the building envelope, we would we would be able to do some of the insulating that that needs to be done, and we would allow those folks who are the professionals to give us all of the things that we can do to improve our energy performance, including what may need to be done with some plumbing. Okay, thank you, because I know well, when it get cold, I have a brother-in-law always call and say, let your water drip, your water drip. so the pipes right. won't burst. Yeah. Ma or maintenance freeze. does that now. When they, when they, mm -hmm. do a, they winterize things, they do leave it. So that's currently done in any facility, if, even in your home, just like yeah. your, your brother-in-law said. That, that's a wise move to make. But if I could add something, Madam Chair, if you don't mind. The, the, the gist of this is that First of all, if this is voted on and approved, this is not an impact on taxpayers. This does not impact taxpayers at all. The way this does in, in full transparency is schools are able to, in, in essence, get a loan to pay for the equipment up front and off the savings that you have from your energy is how you make your loan payments. School districts do it, companies do it all, all the time. What it allows you to do is you're, we're going to spend the money anyway. We're either going to send it to the power company or the water company or we can have brand new equipment in schools and send it to pay the loan that's that's generally how that works and in the event that you if you ever fall short the company then pays and writes a check um, for any of the difference for, for that particular month so the benefit of it is that you have new systems and I'll tell you right now majority of our mechanical systems in our schools are old mm -hmm. and um, they're not efficient but with COVID, having new systems that meet the guidelines to help protect from COVID would, would be an asset. So that's generally how, that, how this, this works. You're able to address that need of immediacy right now. And, and from start to finish, this being the start to when all of those systems are in place would be something um, along the lines of 18 months, um, maybe, even, maybe even a little longer to make sure that um, we go through the full the full RFP process plus the installation and all of that. So this is not a this is not something we're doing you know just in March or, or you know next year early. It, it's going to be an 18 month process to get to where we're we're getting these energy savings, which is when 
we would start paying back on the loan as well. Other questions or comments? You talked about yeah, Mr. Grant. I think Mr. Oh, Dr. Quinn. Oh, Dr. Quinn. Uh, yeah, uh, I've been on since you got started tonight. Um, but anyway, as far as this, I'm, I'm certainly in favor of saving money from energy. One thing I would be against, however, and I think you need to keep this in mind, is um, one of our previous districts, we had um, our heat and air controlled from a remote site somewhere in the Midwest. And that was a terrific nightmare. And I don't think we need to even consider doing that to our schools in the future. So you might want to keep that in mind, Mr. Grant. Yes, sir. We, we would have full control of our systems on site. That would be what our, our maintenance department would have full control over being able to, to operate those systems. Okay, and I'm talking about they, they regulated the temperature, and they, they just did it by re remote situation, and that just did not work. Uh, we had cold teachers, we had hot teachers, we had uh, cold rooms, um, and we, there was, we couldn't override it. So yes. we, don't, we want to avoid that problem with, what, 32 buildings we've got. Dr. Quinn, I would agree 100%. That's, that's Thank the, you. I agree 100%. The weather in the Midwest is a little different than, than down here in the <laughs> South. But, yes, sir, we have complete control o over that, and those set points are established by the, the district, but also the controls that would be able to be controlled remotely um, by the individuals in this district. So, yes, sir, it, it will it be an in-house control. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments? If not, Mr. Grant, you talked about lighting on the inside of our facilities. Uh, will this include lighting around some of our buildings on the outside? Yes, ma'am. It would be all interior and exterior lighting that we would want to be replaced. I know some of our building is a little dark when we go out, mm -hmm. so that would be a good thing. Thank you very kindly. Other questions or comments? Not. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Finance update. Yes. Good evening, Madam Chair, um, board members, and Dr. Foster. Thank you for the opportunity to give you a financial update tonight. Um, first, I want to begin by uh, giving you an update on our audit for the 2019-2020 year, fiscal year. Let me get back there. One second. There we go. Um, so we are still in the middle of our audit of our audit for the 1920 school year. Um, we know that last year was the first year of consolidation, so our auditors are not only having to audit our financial reports from the 1920 year, but they are also having to reconcile back to the three former districts' financial reports. So we knew that it would take a little longer this year, and we've been fortunate that the state has allowed all school districts an extension on the um, deadline for the financial audit, which is January 15th. So we are working with our auditors to try to make sure we meet that deadline of January 15th. Okay, I also want to cover where we are to date in this fiscal year. So, so far in general fund revenues, we've collected about $23.1 million in state revenues, about $2.5 million in local revenues, and we have about $1.3 million in transfers. And we know that tax um, notices just went out. So beginning this month and um, probably through March, we'll collect about 90% of our tax collections. So you'll notice in, in uh, the next couple of months that the local revenue amounts will increase drastically. All right, as far as our general fund expenditures, you, you've heard me say often that our people account for 85% of our budget. Well, this shows you or it demonstrates that salary and friends from July through November accounted for about 83%, which was um, $35 million. Purchase services was $3.5 million. And supplies and materials accounted for $2 million in expenditures. Um, please note that this is just general fund expenditures. It does not include any federal or state um, accounts as far as expenditures.
All right, moving on to next year. We are about to start the process of planning our budget for the next fiscal year. So tomorrow we'll have a principal's meeting where we will distribute a budget packet and you have a, a sample in your folder of the budget packet that the principals will receive. They'll receive it tomorrow and we're asking that the principals return those back to us by January 15th. Senior staff will then review those budget requests that are submitted from the principals. And the principals will have an opportunity to come in and meet with senior staff individually and request um, any needs that their schools may need. It may be capital, um, capital needs or equipment needs or maybe they need a new position that they would like to request they'll have an opportunity to come in and explain their need to the cabinet members. So that will take place February 8th through the 12th. And then we plan to have our first budget work session on March 23rd. All right. And then we are also in the middle of our year end processes. So we plan to have W-2s um, to the employees by January 29th, which would be the deadline. Um, along with the W-2s this year, the employees will receive a memo that is also in your packet that explains the, the figures that are reported on a W-2 so that they know what we're reporting to the IRS and what we're reporting to the Department of Revenue. So it explains what makes up those numbers that are on that W-2 form. Employees are also able to access their W-2s through the Visions portal. They can access the 2019 W-2s right now. After January 29th, they'll be able to access their um, 2020 W-2 as well. And then our vendors will receive the 1099s for those vendors that were paid more than $600 during the year of 2020. They'll receive their 1099s by January 29th as well. Do you all have any questions? I have one. I have, I have one comment. Just, just, just yes, a sir. point of clarity. Um, finance has been working extremely hard trying to just make sure they they gather things and get them in a workable manner. You can expect every month now a monthly financial report as you just received. Moving forward, now that we have a, a clear understanding and, and are getting towards um, bringing those things, those three separate districts' uh, finances together into one. So, um, just wanted to make sure the board was aware of that. We are now at a point that we can give a monthly um, financial report, um, not only to the board, but also to the community. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. My comment was very good report. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next we have Dr. Washington. Good evening, Good Madam evening. Chair, board members, Dr. Foster. I have two items for you this evening. The first one is uh, graduation 2021. Um, in light of the pandemic we're still dealing with, uh, for the safety of our students, faculty, and staff, we're recommending that commencement exercises for the class of 2021 be held in the same manner that we did this past year by each high school having their own graduation on their football field and with uh, limited uh, tickets and seating. Um, at this time, there are no venues that are really renting out any facilities um, due to COVID-19, and we're at the point now where we need to start preparing for graduation for this coming June. So we would like to ask for uh, um, action on that if possible. Okay. Madam Chair, Matt Mash, one yes, other comment. We, we have reached out in, in, in preparation of trying to secure a venue, but South Carolina, due to the COVID, South Carolina State is not renting and we don't know when, and we can't hold off announcements um, trying to get those support services if we're at the last minute. The pandemic, pandemic says we have to go back. So we're trying to now get sound. We're trying to get those things in place for graduation. So we felt, we felt it best to move in this direction. Um, at least for this year, and then come back next year um, if we're back to any sense of normalcy for the board to consider um, having a unit, a unified graduation at one centralized location. So we're just doing this in preparation to get the word out to our communities and our students, as I'm sure they're concerned about how that's going to look. Yeah, there are the questions. You've heard the recommendation coming from Dr. Washington. 
At this time, we'll entertain a motion. Madam Chair, I move that we accept the administration recommendation to hold commencement exercise for the class of 2021 at each school's football field as presented. Second. Okay. It has been moved and properly second that we accept the administrator's recommendation to hold commencement exercises of the class of 2021, 2021 at each school football field as presented. Are there questions? Are there questions pertaining to graduation for 2021? Comments? All in favor, let it be known by a show of hands. Are there any opposes? Dr. O'Quinn? I'm in favor. Thank you very kindly. Unanimous. Okay. Great. <clears throat> Next, what I have for you is the packet, um, which is section B of your board policies. And basically what I have done is all of our conversations that we've had around policies since September, I have put them all together. The policies that you see listed on the front are all the policies that should be in this section. Um, the first four are bold. We've had um, numerous discussions about those, so I just wanted to highlight that. And the policies with the asterisks on it are the changes that we've made, and those are also highlighted in yellow inside your packet. Um, this is for your review. Um, we can go through and adjust or talk about, discuss any policies at any time that you all uh, feel necessary, but this is what we have at this point, <clears throat> and in January, we'll be moving on to Section G. Ms. Oma. Uh, yes, Madam Chair. Policy BID. Um, there is a question um, because it refers to board member compensation and expenses, and then it, I think it hinges on, a pen, or depends on policy DKC. Policy BID is your fourth policy from the end of your packet, mm -hmm. if everyone wants to look at that. <clears throat> so that's almost referring to, and I'm going to pass around. Right? I have DKC okay. here. I went forward before the meeting. Okay, the third paragraph, yeah. Just to, just to recap, uh, policy BID is board member compensation and expenses. It accompanies policy DKE, which is in the finance section of the board policy manual. Um, so I just passed that particular policy out so that you all could put the two side by side for any discussion um, if we need to have that. Madam, Ms. Carson. Discussion on this policy DKC. This policy that we are looking at, it was implemented or issued in 97. Then we move, then it was revised again in 2002. And then it was discussed on the 19, 2019, and it went back 23 years ago to what was in place. And it, I'm in reference to meals, $25 per day for in-state. That only would take care of one meal. And out-of-state, it was $32 per day for out-of-state. And, and this policy was uh, in place 97, that's 23 years ago. So just as a, a point of clarification, the policy 
uh, member Carson that you're talking about came from Orangeburg five. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then it was updated, I think in 2002. And then this is the one that you all did with Tiffany mm -hmm. last March of 2019. Right. So this would be the latest one. But, but that was never discussed. You know, when we went out, we didn't know what we were going to get for meals until we got back, and then this was thrust upon us, so we need to revisit this again. And Is change. this an item that you all would like for me to bring in January, or how do you want to move forward with that this evening? Yes. Board members? Yes. Would you like for Dr. Washington to bring this back in January? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Is that common consent? Yes. Assuming yes, Dr. Yeah. Washington. We'll have listed as an agenda item. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions about Section B that you all have? Any other questions on the policy B for Dr. Washington? Hearing none. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, next we're down to communication. Thank you, Madam Chair, ladies and gentlemen of the board, and Dr. Foster for the opportunity to give a brief update on communications for our school district. Um, I hope that you've noticed, um, I know board members have, thank you for your, your kind comment, comments about our new district website, which we launched on Tuesday, November 17th, um, about a week before we um, took a brief break for Thanksgiving. Um, our team has been hard at work, and I just can't even express to you the dedication that they have shown in making sure that our school district moved forward quickly with a new district website um, that we could access quickly. In fact, Dr. Holloway just sent over the FAFSA information that you were um, asking about, and I was listening to um, Dr. Washington while also putting up an announcement, and we'll continue to publicize that through this additional, um, this additional platform that we have. I do wanna take you through just a few of, um, a few things with our website, and unfortunately my clicker is not working. There we go. Okay, so our district website has a button in the top left. Um, and by clicking on that button, you can select the language of your preference. There are literally hundreds of languages that our website can be fully translated into. And these are just a couple of screenshots. I selected Spanish as that is the um, predominant second language within our school district. Um, but you'll see important messages such as a on the bottom left, as well as all of our um, all of our information about enrolling in Orangeburg Online, um, to our announcements, um, that gives you the complete website experience just in your language of choice. Some additional functionality about the web page um, is that the, the, on the very top there are a series of channels, and when you click on one of those, um, the very first one is about OCSD and then you'll drop down to sections. Um, this is just an example of the superintendent section. And you'll see in the bottom right corner that currently our website has an alert at the top, which we already utilize and will continue to do so for important information. And that alert, when you first click on it the first time, it makes you look at it and then click OK. Um, and then it follows you around as you visit additional pages and sections on the website, just to make sure you're, um, you're aware of that important information. Um, the, the next channel, and I won't go through all these, but just highlights, um, is our departments and divisions. We separated each of these um, departments um, or divisions under, um, under the main title. Um, and so you'll see for curriculum and instruction, um, on the right you um, have a series of pages um, detailing things from Kate to Orangeburg Online, um, and, and all of the different information that our students and families need access. We've separated our resources by groups, 
And um, so you'll see that um, we have resources for families, for staff, and for community. Um, our staff resources include such things as how to enter a trouble ticket, um, as well as our salary schedule, um, benefits, and just things that really are specific for staff members. Our website can also serve as an intranet, uh, meaning that our staff members will use their email credentials to log in. And so if there's important information that's critical just to staff that isn't necessarily for the public and for our students, um, that our staff members will get into um, the habit of logging in and then that is just unique to their, um, to their employment with our school district. Um, you all have been so helpful in helping um, move forward our, our board member page, so I did want to highlight that. Um, we've had photographs taken over the last couple of months, and you've submitted bios, and um, we've greatly appreciated that. Um, you'll see on, when you click on the school board channel, you'll see that we ha it lands on the members. Um, and there you have our school board members and their photograph. And if you click on their photograph, it will include a short bio as well as contact information. Um, and then just under school board, we also have our agendas and minutes and our policies. Um, and we do have a goal in the next um, couple of months to be streaming our meeting straight to our district website. We have um, hopefully, um, as, as our community um, becomes accustomed with utilizing our website, um, we've tried to make it um, easy to access really pertinent information through what we're calling global icons. For instance, um, you'll see um, that we have a series of these um, along a row for right now. We can change these as we um, would like to, but for right now it's a nice fall picture. Um, and you'll see that when you click on employment, um, with one click, you go directly to our enrollment page, and um, that also includes information not only for enrolling in our school district, which is the first, the first step, um, but also if you um, would prefer for your children to access their learning environment online, the enrollment link for Orangeburg Online is there as well. Um, this is just one example of how um, we have organized critical information. Um, there's multiple ways to access it. So, for instance, um, we have a staff directory, and um, Human Resources has been so wonderful in working with us to help develop that. Um, but there's, there's multiple ways to access that information, so it's not only just available under about OCSD, and about us, but there's also a global icon for that same information, which takes you directly to the staff directory. And um, the, the next slide is um, just taking you through the, the remainder of the web page. Um, announcements, news, um, a calendar. Um, being a um, busy working mom, and I think the most important thing on our website is probably our calendar. Um, no one wants to miss um, something that's important to their child and to their child's school. Um, so for our calendar is accessible on the top right. It's its own channel. But we also have um, our upcoming events displayed. So you'll see that the next four upcoming events for our school district are displayed prominently on our website. Um, and just finishing out the, the home page of our district, um, social media, uh, we want to continue to invite parents and students in our community to utilize our district um, provided devices for virtual health um, in partnership with Palmetto Care Connections and virtual health care providers throughout our community. We do have an icon on all of our devices, um, which takes you directly to virtual, the virtual health care provider of your choice, which is extremely critical right now as we're all uh, managing in this um, COVID pandemic. Um, but that's also on our website, some information about the partnership as well as access, um, as well as your access there, and some quick links, um, things like PowerSchool, Parent Portal, the lunch menus, um, just some, some things that people want access to rather quickly. And then the homepage rounds out with facts and figures and contacts for our school district. Um, and that, that's really it for the website. Um, we are going to continue to um, 
add content. It is not um, done. It never will be. It is, um, you know, something that we can add to in a moment's notice, and uh, we'll continue to do that. Um, we have moved forward very, very quickly. As I said, we launched the district site on the 17th of November. Um, the very next day, we met with principals about the about their school sites. We hosted a focus group Friday of that week with a teacher. Uh, we actually chose a che teacher of the year from each level, so elementary, middle, and high. Um, we also spoke with a classified staff member um, who had been recognized by his or her peers um, as a classified staff member of the year. We know that um, our school secretaries are often the ones who pick up the phone and um, think, wow, if we had a website, I probably, this parent or this person um, may have had access to this information. Uh, we know that they are the ones that often get the same question over and over again. And not only do we want um, parents to not have to waste their time calling, um, but we also want the information to be consistent um, throughout our school district. Um, and we also, so it was principals, teachers, and um, secretaries, as well as several members of our instructional services department. Um, so currently we are, just like we did with our, with our district site, our, we have put out the information that that focus group and our principals decided was pertinent on the school websites. And currently our two webmasters are building school pages. Um, our goal is still that we will have those um, updated and ready. Um, I told you late um, 2020, early 21, and um, we, it, it, it's, I'm very confident that we're going to make that goal. Um, and my last slide of tonight is just a, a very brief update. Um, we have been making efforts throughout the last several months to create a strong brand for our school district. And we're doing that through clarity, consistency, and constancy. Um, so um, every member of our employment, um, of our every employee in our school district now has a consistent email signature. Um, and so people are receiving that constantly. It's consistent. Um, we're switching out all of the, um, the signage in our schools. So you'll see that on the left. Um, we have just developed, and um, this is really just right hot off the press from, our, from Dijon Jackson, our graphic designer. Um, but in the middle, you'll see a district one-page marketing sheet. Um, and so this will highlight just some of the many wonderful things going on in our school district. Um, and we do have a goal to develop these for each and every school within our district as well. Uh, we'd like for realtors and big companies that are um, considering moving to the area to know that they can share that type of high quality marketing material with families who may be interested in moving to our community. In addition, um, just, just to recap um, the flags that were generously provided by the NAACP that we cannot wait to raise all together at 11.30 a.m. on Thursday morning, um, as well as the, um, the wrapped activity buses that will soon be, um, that will soon just sort of be um, rolling billboards for our school district. Um, so it, it has been a lot of fun to be part of all these projects, and I'm just grateful for the opportunity. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. A comment. Um, I've had the opportunity to go to the website last evening. Yes, ma'am. Very informative. Thank you. Very user-friendly. User and I'm just excited about the what you've accomplished in the amount of time. And very, it's all well done. Thank you. Well, it, it was certainly, um, I, I wish my team was here with me tonight because it, um, it was really not me, but I have a wonderful team, and thank you very much. And I'd like to piggyback on what Ms. Oma said. <coughs> thank you so much with you and your team. You're doing thank a very you. great job. Looks so much better. Thank, thank you. you very much. <laughs> oh, this, I know they're tuning in, so I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Me too. Thank you. Okay. No other questions or comments. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Maybe. Okay. We are down now to human resources update. 
Uh, yes, ma'am, Madam Chair. I'm going to pitch it for Mr. Holiday um, tonight. Um, what you want to give you an update? We mentioned that we we're going to send out letters of intent so we can get an idea for planning purposes as we move into the budget season, but also um, recruitment for, for our, our teaching positions. Um, to date, we were able to send out intent letters uh, electronically for the first time, and they were able to respond um, using iVision. So we can now have, we have that data in a digital format, and we can manipulate the data to help us. So we can now disaggregate the data to say math teachers, science teachers, without having to flip through a lot of paper. So uh, just another efficiency um, that would help us out here in the district. But um, to date, uh, the surveys closed November 30th. We had 1,617 employees uh, accept the letter of intent with the intent of returning next year. Uh, 24 employees um, indicated that, that they would not be returning due to retirement or, or resignation. 15 of those were certified and nine of those were classified. Um, a total of 267 employees did not complete their letters of intent. And um, HR, now that we have it digitally, we can click a button and say who didn't do it, and we can contact those individuals um, individually to get feedback. So we're moving forward trying to plan, and this is pertinent given the budget process that we're about to go through is, go through here shortly. So I want to just give a board an update on, on that data. Good. Anything else? If not, I would like to just um, thank Ms. Mary Oma, or congratulate Ms. Oma, for being appointed to the South Carolina School Board's Insurance Trust Board of Directors. Congratulations, Ms. Oma. Next, we will entertain a motion to go into executive session for personnel recommendations, personnel matters, and contractor matters. Madam Chair, I make a motion that we enter into executive sessions to discuss personnel recommendation, personnel matters, and contractual matters. Second. It has been moved and pro properly second that we enter into executive session for personnel recommendations, personnel matters, and contractual matters. Any comments? If not all in favor, let it be known by a show of hand. If there are any opposers, thank you very kindly.
Open session. Madam Chair, I move that we return to open session. Second. And it has been moved and properly second that we return to open session. All in favor, let it be known by a show of hand. Dr. Quinn. Any up thank you. Any opposes? Thank you. Unanimous. At this time we will entertain a motion on any action coming from the executive session. Madam Chair. I make a motion of the recommendation for personnel employment, reassignment, and or separation based on our superintendent. Second. It has been moved and properly second that we approve the recommendation for employment, employee uh, recommendation coming from our superintendent on employment, separation, and reassignment. reassignment. Any questions or comments? All in favor, let it be known by a show of hand. Dr. Quinn. Okay, any opposers? Unanimous. Thank you. At this time, we are down now to announcements. Are there any announcements? Madam Chair, if I could. Uh, yes, sir. I want to take an opportunity to wish everybody a happy holiday. I won't see you all until January, but be safe and... and uh, have a happy holiday season and happy new year. So. Thank you. 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 Okay, our next meeting will be January the 12th, 2021. And I would like to say a happy Merry Christmas and a happy new year to all of you. And please, ma'am, and please, sir, make sure you are safe and careful. And at this time, we'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Madam Chair, I make a motion that we adjourn until our next meeting next year in the new year, January 12, 2021. Very good. Okay. Moved and properly second that we adjourn this meeting. All in favor, let it be known by a show of hands. Dr. O'Quinn, thank you, thank you. And you have a good one as well, Dr. O'Quinn. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you.